So we have the uh, full crew in studio here today, uh, fed by Jim Klein, who brought a uh, dozen donuts. They're in the kitchen if you missed them. And on the uh, box of donuts was inscribed, pastries over partisanship. This is the theme of which he wishes you to operate today, pastries over partisanship. So if you can all wipe the sugar from your mouths and don't get the... I skipped my studio sticky. Yeah. As, as the least partisan member of this group, I'll yes. be happy to tell Mr. Klein I had one. Very tasty. Thank you. I think we would all agree that you would be the least partisan member of the group. I think that's a fair and, statement. And the debate begins. <laughs> We're up and running already here. Uh, the Friday crew with uh, from the first half hour, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield still here present and uh, accountable. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Rob, and I'm sharing my mic with my good friend, John, John Gilstrap. So Indeed. If, so if I start talking too much, John will just pull the mic away, pull the mic away. <laughs> it's been a long-time dream of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Gil Probably Strap. one shared with a listener. <laughs> the human mute button right there. <laughs> Boom. I knew that. <laughs> yeah, also uh, with us, as we mentioned, John Gilstrap is in the uh, Joe Ferretti seat today. Joe, not available by phone today. John in studio. John, welcome back. Thank you much. Nice to be here. Delegate Mike Height returns. Good morning, Robert. Great to be here. And the senior member of our crew, the anchor, Michael Carl. Good morning, everybody. Now, uh, as you know, uh, intros are always a part of the Friday program uh, whenever I remember to write them, at least anyway. And I was looking over my Word document, and I discovered in doing so that for the first time, Michael Carl is first on the intros. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. <clears throat> DeSantis, Haley, Bergam, and Scott. That's not a law firm. That's just half of the Republicans we've got. Crammed as they were on the stage Wednesday night. The battle was for the heart of the right. But Mike Carl, did Christie or Asa, Ramaswamy or Pence convince anybody that they're just vice presidents? No. <laughs> Many... Many good presidential prospects there. Many good presidential prospects. Now, uh, for the uh, next segment here, uh, I need special music. And for that special music, I turn to... It's coming. You're up, Larry. He has that train up coming. It's rolling down the track. He has been indicted, but he's still coming back. Trump's back in Fulton County, and lately he's been there a lot. You want to make Larry Schultz smile, you show him a Donald Trump mug shot. <laughs> I got to tell you that I, I actually thought about stopping by my office and taking that mug shot and turning it into a <clears throat> sort of thing I could hold over my face, but... I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't deny my wife the pleasure of seeing me on TV like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't get it done. And we did get the shot up on TV. Dylan got it up there for everybody. So, Good. Just in case you missed that. By the way, no comments on my ability to carry a Johnny Cash tune. Oh, that was great. I, it was, <laughs> as far as you ph- know, it was wonderful. Phenomenal. <laughs> as, far as, <laughs> as far as you know, it was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, hey, yeah, well, moving on the list here. Uh, let's see who's next up on our uh, fun. It is uh, time for Mr. Height. Uh, book number 28 just dropped hot off the presses. Another Jonathan Graves adventure to clean up those messes. Yes, this is still for Height. That New York Times bestseller is called Harm's Way, and nine ninety nine for the book is not a bad price to pay. But the next John Gilstrap book is the one I want to read. That's the one where Mike Height paid $3,000 to be the male lead. <laughs> The hero. I get to be the hero. All right, so, John, you actually got kind of two intros on that because yours, yours kind of yeah. bled into Mike's. Yeah. In the Ferretti seat this week is Jonathan Gilstrap, sharing a camera with Bill Stubblefield, a really fine chap. John pumps out books the way caps pump out a, cats pump out a litter and gets only slightly less attention than a Trump interview on Twitter. Where the FBI failed, John soon succeeds at his job. In his next book, Heat Seeker, he makes me into a rat for the mob. <laughs> well, that's actually true. I, 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 it's, it doesn't end well if that makes you feel better. <laughs> As it shouldn't for rats. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't make me feel better either way. If I was a rat for the mob, someone's getting me one way or the other. They say in life there are certain things of which you have no say. 
For instance, like death and taxes, which we all must pay. There are a couple of other things in life for which I'm certain, where you don't have to be controlling things like Oz behind a curtain. Like I know every time I think I've seen or heard it all, along comes a tale that can only be classified as tall. You know our man the Admiral gets his words into a tangle, and often comes out with an English language that's a bit of a mangle? I learned just this week while sitting on this very bench that Bill Stubblefield once tried to learn French. <laughs> Very poorly. <laughs> now, I will let you judge whether his English or French is messier as he asked the nearest Gaucon to please bring around La Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see how you do this <laughs> in a couple of hours. Uh, it's not drugs. I can promise yeah. you. I'm, I can pass the test right now. All right. Uh, issue number one goes to the man sitting in the Ferretti chair, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. All right. In the 1780s, Thomas Jefferson wrote, quote, I hold that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing, and as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. An observation of this truth should render honest governors so mild in their punishment of rebellions as to not discourage them too much. It is a medicine necessary for the sound health of government. Now, on Wednesday, during the, the debate, Vivek Ramaswamy said, quote, I stand on the side of revolution, and I don't apologize for that. That makes some other people nervous, but that's the fact of the matter of who I am and what I stand for in this race. And I have a feeling that's what the people in this country are actually going to choose. So now there's a wide perception which with, I, which, with which I happen to agree that the Biden administration is in the process of criminalizing critical expression and encouraging the kind of... <laughs> <laughs> and encouraging the kind of social gaslighting that has popular opinion and the media accepting as gospel such nonsensical notions as men can have babies and the concerned parents should be considered domestic terrorists. The emperor has no clothes and those who dare to point that out are shouted down, canceled, and vilified. I think societal anger is at a temperature that I've never witnessed it. So here's the question to the panel. Are we on the brink of rebellion and revolution? Well, we're on the brink of rebellion and revolution. Let's start first with the man who professed to be the least partisan member of our crew today, <clears throat> Attorney at Law Larry Schultz. Well, um, who better to understand rebellion uh, than Thomas Jefferson, uh, who missed the big one against his home state, uh, didn't make it to the day when that one started, um, in his own state, um, against, uh, you know, ultimately decided by the North, uh, in favor of the North, against people like Thomas Jefferson slaveholders and those who took 14 year old mistresses from among their slave children and made them the mothers of their children so uh, I, you know Thomas Jefferson is a revered American uh, person but I'm not necessarily taking his views as uh, guaranteed to be right over time um, they certainly wrote an excellent document in the Constitution that can be interpreted to fit the moment when uh, the moment is important, however, and it made itself available to change. Those were all good things. I don't believe we're on the verge of a rebellion in this country. I do think we've got some, um, some folks who believe that that's a legitimate way to express displeasure. Um, and as usual, um, those are people who feel that they are not being heard. And part of the reason I think they're not being heard is because of the leaders they've chosen in the Republican Party. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but meet people all the time who are angry as can be uh, that, um, for example, the rich men north of Richmond uh, are controlling everything. Um, and they write songs, for example, where they punch down on welfare recipients rather than the bosses who aren't paying them. It's funny, the Republican Party tells us generally, if you don't like your situation, you know, strike forth and get a new job and, and make more money. The very people who stop um, Americans from doing that are the very people that they put in charge of their party. There's not much you can do about that. Who are they going to rebel against? That's the problem, I think. 
that the, it's their own leaders who they're angry at. And I don't know who they will rebel against within that party. Mr. Carl. Well, let, let me say the rebellion, you know, uh, evolving policy and programs, you know, that's – but, but the, the, the means of it is important, and, and, and violence is, is wrong, you know. Our, our founders set up a system to uh, uh, enable, alter, you know, evolving policy – but it's supposed to be peaceful. And, it, and the main thing, uh, I, I don't agree with your characterization of the, of the candidates for, uh, and on the Republican side who, you know, who were on the debate the other day. Uh, I think most of them still, and this is real important when you, you know, have rebellion, but it is a, a, within a system that, has, that character, is characterized by eternal values that we should always respect and and, and that that's you know individual rights and that that type of thing and free enterprise uh, and the opportunities and that type of thing it's so, so uh, the the me the means and the and the you know the, the uh, implication of violence that's that's a that's wrong and should be avoided but but the openness to change while continuing to respect great American values, which are perpetual and forever. Well stated, Mr. Carl. Mr. Stumblefield. Yeah, actually, I'm going to say the same thing Mike did, but in different words. Uh, I thought Mike did a good job. Uh, we tend to romanticize the words like rebellion and revolution. Uh, but these are never words to be romanticized. We think of uh, the Civil War. That was rebellion. That was revolution. It was very bloody and created a havoc for generations on top of generations. Uh, we have probably in front of us the greatest uh, document besides the Bible ever written, and that was our Constitution. Uh, it provides the guidelines in, in which to state our points, our beliefs. And I'm going to echo what Mike Carl said. It provides the guidelines for doing this in a civil, uh, nonviolent way. There's every, every one of us on a on daily basis find things that we are uncomfortable with, things we do not like things, uh, positions taken by our legislators, by our elected leaders. But we find in most every case a way to reconcile our differences within the bounds of our Constitution. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's very, and I, I listened to the debate, and I heard uh, uh, Ramasamy mention the word, re I'm, I'm a revolutionary, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm, 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 I am a revolutionary, uh, and I I viewed that as as theater more than anything else. I hope it was not serious. Uh, if it is serious, uh, we're we're walking down a path that we saw in the late 1850s uh, that there's going to be no bounds. People take uh, uh, they express their unhappiness, their dissatisfaction by by rebellion, rebellion or revolution, and that never works out well. As, unless it's done in a peaceful sort of way, such as what Martin Luther King did. Delegate Height. Well, first I'm going I'm to start with taking umbrage to the disparaging remarks of one of our founding fathers, especially when you mention taking 14-year-old mistresses or wives, which was very socially acceptable in that day and very common amongst those people of that day and thank goodness we have evolved beyond that um, but West Virginia not until last year um, you could take a 14 year old wife um, and we have fixed some of those things but that was very common back in that day and I don't think you can hold people accountable for doing what something that was socially acceptable in their day having said that uh, you know we the question was about rebellion um, and I think you can look at rebellion and re revolution in in different ways and I think there is rebellion and revolution going on in our country right now in a much different way and many people look at Donald Trump as the, a revolutionary a rebellious person 
who is not satisfied with the status quo and how things are run in Washington, and he is rebelling. And those people behind him are, are rebelling as well. So we look at it, it, rebelling in revolution does not always mean taking up arms and, and fighting to the death amongst each other. Uh, rebellion comes in different forms. So I believe we're seeing rebellion right now, and I'm hoping that that's what Ramaswamy was referring to, not open uh, revolution where we're, we're taking lives, but a, a revolution in, in terms of, of what we're seeing right now in the political landscape. It goes back to you, Mr. Gilstrap. I think we need to make a d distinction between what is right and wrong and what might happen or what's being teed up to happen. And before I get too deep into this, I should say, you know what I do for a living, right? I mean, I, I, I make stuff up. I imagine circumstances where things spin out of control. So I don't know if that creates a certain paranoia or if it just gives you a different squint on the world. But in, in, I've, I've been around the sun 60-odd times now, and growing up, you know, when, when there, was, there was dissent in the 60s and in the 70s, and the, the pressure relief valve was always calm discussion, among politicians and calm discussions among neighbors, calm, you know, being kind of kind of a, a, a wishy thing. There was a lot of shouting, but everybody had equal voice. And what I'm con really concerned about now, and I am concerned about violent revolution. I don't, I don't. It's not something I, I want or or condone, but I think we've rendered so many people voiceless, while they're being their perception is being victimized by overreaching government. We've got this state. You know, we've got the entire, so much of this economy is, is tied to energy that the administration is trying to kill and seeming without a lot of, of thought into the, the consequences of, of what they're doing. The COVID lockdowns, if, if you disagreed with it, you were shouted down and called names. You were encouraged, if you recall, to rat out your neighbors. You know, if there was a lockdown, if you saw your neighbors, you should outside the house. You're supposed to call them, uh, call the police, and 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 have um, have action taken. I'm just concerned that with the breakdown in the media and the breakdown in interpersonal communication and the vilification of the opposite point of view, the relief valves are shutting down. And once the relief valves shut down people will resort to violence. It's not something I want, but it is something I kind of see coming, and it concerns me. Let me just state that that shouting down was going on both sides. John, I'm sure you know that as well. There were no shortage of people walking around calling people who were wearing a mask sheep and, and bleeding oh, at I them agree. and whatever. I mean, that, that certainly went on on, uh, on both sides. You're, you grew up in the 60s, mm -hmm. right? Bill, you were around in the 60s. Larry, Mike, you were around in the 60s. Uh, Mike Heights a little bit younger than being too conscious about the 60s. In 1968, which was a very dangerous, volatile year in American history with assassinations of, of important leaders. I was five. Uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember going through certain sections of Pittsburgh that were uh, burned out, uh, sections where if you went through, you locked the doors, rolled the windows up, right, uh, that sort of thing. And, and those sections of town remain like that for a long time, places that used to be uh, vibrant cultural districts with bands and restaurants and, and shops were in tatters for years, right? So I'm not sure where that ranks on the revolution scale, but it certainly was a pretty powerful one uh, back in the 60s, and we've seen sparks of that ignite every now and then, maybe every 20 years or so. Uh, I don't know that we're living in any more volatile times than we lived in the 60s, when there was a revolution that did result in a lot of turnover and change and violence brought it about in some cases. Uh, civil rights laws brought change about LBJ signing, uh, signing uh, uh, different uh, pieces of law into order. Uh, but I think we, we make whatever time we're currently living in as always the most dangerous and most volatile time. But when you look back, certainly there have been volatile, dangerous times that we've all kind of seen ourselves. And... If you, were, you weren't alive in 1861, uh, obviously, and you weren't alive in 1941 when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, but we've been through times like this before. Yes, we have. Uh, and 
prior to the Second World War, there was a lot of friction and uh, various factions in the U.S. Should we get involved in Europe? Should we not get involved? So there have been numerous times. I think there's a difference right now, though, and that's social media. We did not have the social media in, in the previous times. Uh, that tends to... Uh, uh, harden your position because you you read from social media posts views similar to yours or maybe a little bit more severe than yours. You pick up on that. So I think the social media has and and John mentioned earlier uh, that there is more volatile than he remembers. I think their causes are probably not much more volatile, but the mechanism for expressing our frustration is different than what we've had in the times past. Well, social media certainly allows for a lot of people to get together in a quick uh, way, uh, at least to post thoughts and, and maybe even gather and do things. But could you not also say that social media also allows a lot of people to blow off steam? Yes, it does. Right? I mean, Absolutely. yeah, I'm not sure. You could be the bravest keyboard warrior in the world and never have to back it up. Keyboard yeah, it, and I, it should work that way. I'm not sure it does work that way, Rob, because... I do not tend to, well, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I would imagine that if I was on Facebook, I would not spend very much time reading posts from a viewpoint radically different than my own. I would tend to read those posts similar to my own thinking. So it's, it's uh, when you blow off steam, it serves as inspiration for somebody else. I think it all serves to harden one's view more so than the, the more positive benefit of just blowing off steam. Final word goes to you, John. During the 60s, <clears throat> the unrest that happened there, the one thing we could count on is that ultimately the, um, the establishment, which was actually the term for it at the time, would come down on the side of the law-abiding citizens. The property that was burned, the, the, the people who were burning the property were prosecuted and, uh, to the degree that they could be. And we were assuming that the property owners were in the right. And that has changed now with the, the summer of love and the, the burning of, you know, the, the, the protests after the, the various killings and what have you. Um, there's just a perception now, I, I think, of um, anarchy in, in a lot of America. And um, whether it's true or not is irrelevant, actually. I, it, it's it's the sense of it, and I think you're right. I think social media is. It, well, I think the social media is the the ultimate end of of America as we've known it. And and Bill, I am on social media, and that's exactly what happens. People just go to their to their echo chambers and shout. Well, this may be the first time when almost everybody feels, in some form or fashion, that the government is against them, both the left and the right. Yeah. <laughs> they feel like yeah. the federal yeah. government is now. Exactly right. Against them, they seem to be united on that. At least that's that's the one thing bringing all Americans together is the federal government's out to get me. All right, uh, hey, eight uh, fifty nine. We're going to do our uh, top of the hour break here, and we'll be right back with uh, Bill Stubblefield on the clock. Bill, you are on the clock. I'm on the clock. After the debate, Republican debate on Wednesday, I went to various uh, news streams to see their response or reaction, and I was struck by the fact that on one, they mentioned one or two or three candidates did super well, the others did poorer, less, less well, and then went to another news stream, and they had a different two or three people that did well. And a third new stream, still a different one. Seems like everyone viewed the uh, the candidates uh, again through their own lens, which is typical. But there was no there was no universal agreement who stood out. So I want to ask my colleagues, my distinguished colleagues around the table, which candidate excited? I'm not saying did the best. Which candidate excited, and which candidate disappointed you the most? And why? I'm especially curious about the the why aspect on on the disappointment and the excitement. Mike, Hutt, you go first. Um, so I wasn't excited about any of them. It, they were terrible, all of them. Um, and I, I was probably most disappointed by Tim Scott. I was really hoping that Tim Scott would um, uh, come out and, and establish a, a foothold as one of the leaders in this group of individuals, and uh, that just didn't happen. Um, 
I know a lot of people thought Ramaswamy did well. I, I wasn't one of those people. Um, I thought Nikki Haley did well. Um, so I, I guess it's all perception and how you look at it. Um, all in all, I would say it was a loss for the Republican Party. And who do you think was the worst of the group, Mike? Um, you know, probably somebody like Asa Hutchinson. I mean, they, there's there was a couple of individuals there. They're just irrelevant, just totally irrelevant. And, you know, even a Chris Christie, who I think is only there to throw bombs at Trump. So, you know, I don't know that he came off very well either. Stats showed Mike Pence got the most talking time. Asa Hutchinson got the least amount of uh, talking time. Michael Carl. Well, uh, as Bill knows, uh, I shared at breakfast yesterday, uh, I sat in front of the TV and fell asleep before it started. <laughs> but, but. We've got to get a younger with, crew in with, here. With anticipation. <laughs> but I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw uh, the, uh, I saw a replay of the closing statements. Oh, there, that's but good. I, but I followed a lot of the coverage as well. And, and uh, uh, I think Haley did, you know, did, did quite well, so it's my understanding. And, uh Scott, not as well as I hope, because I'm I'm a pretty big fan of his, but uh, uh, but I liked the, that Pence was making these points and so forth. So uh, uh, I, you know, and and, and the uh, Florida guy, <laughs> named <Yeah>. DeSantis, <laughs> uh, the sanctimonious, you mean. yes, uh, you know, he he he's got all kinds of posies on paper, but his performance, you know. Live and uh, is under undermines his quality of his record. So I that kind of a mixed bag. Mr. Gilstrap. At this stage in the election, you know what is what's a win in a debate like this? It's it's to be noticed. It's to fade in you know, to actually come into focus from being on the outside for so long. And in that way, I think that Vivek uh, Ramaswamy walked away with it. He was, I don't agree with everything he said. I don't agree with a lot of the stuff he does say, but there's an energy there and there's an ease and there's a contact with the electorate that I found exciting. Um, especially in contrast to the, the, the guys on the left, where the, the um, Pence and Christie and Hutchinson, who just seem like those old school, tired politicians and it came out that way number two for me or maybe tied for first was Nikki Haley I thought she uh, while she didn't get a lot of talk time I think she nailed what she said she seemed articulate and smart a little bit angry and that's a, that's a good thing in this case her exchanges back and forth with Ramaswamy I thought were were exciting she was in really she was engaged in the debate in a way that the others weren't I think DeSantis just seemed rehearsed and 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 boring. Pence is milk toast. I, you know, Pence is in this weird place where he complains, he, he brags about the Trump Pence administration, and then he comes out as an attack dog against Trump. And it's, it, he doesn't pull it off well. Um, and it just, it just seems disingenuous to me. The guy that I never heard of and whose name I've blanked on, this is the fifth time in Burgum. two days. Burgum. I thought he was interesting only because I had never heard of him, and he came off as smart and charming and as a um, decentralized government kind of guy. But I don't think anybody, nobody won or lost the election last night. But I think uh, we'll be talking about Ramaswamy more than we otherwise would have, and Nikki Haley too. Larry Schultz. I, I think it is, um, I tend to agree with John that, Except for uh, Ramaswamy and Haley, it was kind of a, I don't know, a dull evening. I was interested when Haley turned to Mike Pence and said, what about that $8 trillion debt you ran up? Who's going to apologize to our kids for that? And <laughs> it's, it's a really difficult thing for Pence because you can't say, well, I was a part of this great administration. Oops. The one big Republican sin is deficits, and he ran eight years' worth in four years. And so uh, even when he started to say, well, COVID got in the way, Brett Baer interrupted him to say, wait a minute, three and a half million of that was incurred before uh, COVID started. And so that that created, she she put Pence in a spot. Now, will she, you know, 
if she takes everything Pence has, she's still in in a distant third, right? Um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how the polls change if they do. Go back to you, Billy. Yeah, I thought uh, Nikki Haley uh, did a very nice job, but she was talking for the general election more so than the uh, the primary. Uh, and I'm going to be curious to see what the uh, uh, the folks that tend to vote in the primary how they respond to her. But she set the stage very well to make an attractive ticket for a general election if she can get to the general election. I thought Ron DeSantis appeared as angry. Very little uh, knew that he had to offer, mostly angry. Uh, but he did not receive the shots that he was expecting to have. Everything was going to Ramazami. Uh, the, uh, as far as Pence, he did get more airtime, uh, but I think he was trying to disprove this image of being everybody's nice guy. He was very aggressive on the stage. He overtalked. He uh, he interrupted. Uh, he did very much what we anticipated uh, Donald Trump to, to do. So it was not the Pence cam, uh, Pence performance that I was expecting. It was a much more aggressive, and some folks resonate with that. Uh, I uh, I tend to agree that Ramasamy uh, uh, showed a lot of passion, uh, and he uh, he was he's quite articulate. Uh, his timing was good, uh, but he's some of his views are let's say uh, uh, l- they appeal more to the pri- uh, to the hard over primary campaign than they do the more centralist journal campaign. May surprise you to know that uh, Alonzo likes Ramaswamy a lot. Well, you know, I saw a lot of similarities between the two. I was <laughs> talking to Rob before the fact. Uh, they both have a very engaging smile. They're both passionate. They're both articulate. And they're both um, uh, good ambassadors for their cause. So there's a lot of similarities between the two. It was on past my bedtime. Uh, so I tried to catch it on satellite on the drive-in in the morning. I finally found it on the Fox Business Channel, I think, on satellite. So I was able to listen to about 20 minutes of it so mm-hmm. on the drive-in. I was shocked that I, I didn't hear from Nikki Haley uh, more than a blip during those 15, 20 minutes. Same with Asa Hutchinson. Uh, it was mostly Christie, Pence, and Ramaswamy who dominated the microphones during the 15, 20-minute segment I was able to catch before I got here. I don't think that's truly reflective. If you look at the amount of time allotted, uh, 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 obviously Nikki, well, uh, Pence and Nikki Haley both got about the same amount of time. Uh, and then on the lower end, uh, it was uh, uh, Asa Hutchison got very little, as did the fellow from North mm-hmm. Dakota. So really? it's that 20 minutes that you, you monitored. You, you mentioned Pence being aggressive, more aggressive yeah. than you thought. I, I, I would agree with that. But don't you think that most of the time he was being aggressive, it was in defense of his positions or in defense of, of his um, administration when, when he was in office, where people were bringing up things and he was, he was on the defense? And when you're on the defense, I don't think you're winning. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Mike. I think he was on the defense. He was trying to uh, represent or defend uh, the Trump administration, mm-hmm. and he was fairly open in that. Uh, but uh, Nikki Haley uh, especially, uh, and to some degree Chris Christie, uh, uh, took st- took some exception to it and tried to put him on record for what happened during the administration. And then and then, at a later yeah. point, it was Chris Christie that defended him on his actions on January 6th. You know, that's that's so. that's also interesting, if I could elaborate. I thought that was a nice question by uh, uh, Brett Barr to ask. Uh, and, uh, and, and Chris Christie especially jumped up and said he was defending the Constitution. He should be credited. Uh, that was a high mark uh, during a uh, uh, high mark for Pence's career. It, Ramasamy never really gave, uh, gave Pence credit. And DeSanto which should have given credit, was very lukewarm and very hesitant in giving Pence credit, even though it had been just before DeSantis uh, took a position, it had been spelled out that Pence was following the Constitution. I thought DeSantis was, did not equate himself very well in that one. one Agreed. Uh, Jeff Haddock said, disappointed in Scott, surprised by Haley. And I should point out, too, that I didn't hear I Tim agree. Scott talk much at all either during – uh, the segment I was able to hear, and when he did speak, it sounded rehearsed. There's a there's a difficult problem. They're both in South Carolina. In the South Carolina primary, they're going to split. 
of what would ordinarily, if there was only one of them, be the total hey, homer good, vote. Good point. Um, that's 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 a problem for them going forward. Yeah, they are. But uh, prior to Wednesday night, uh, Scott appeared to be the rising star, and Nikki Haley had had her day and was settling. Now I think it's going to change. I've been looking at the polls, and none of the polls have come out that reflect the results of the uh, uh, debate. But I think you're going to see Nikki Haley rising, and Tim Scott is going to be struggling to uh, to stay even. I agree. Well, they're all fighting for second place right now. I think one of the telling moments, irrespective of of the subject itself, the question came up with, "Will you support Donald Trump even if he's if he's uh, convicted of things?" Ramaswamy's hand shot right up. Others were hesitant, and if you watched DeSantis, he was looking around and trying, you know, what's <laughs> what are the cool kids doing? And and I'll and I'll he ultimately did raise his hand, but it seemed like he was polling the crowd first. And that gets back to the old school politician where Ramaswamy, I thought, really, really shown was at the, the very end where you know, your final statement, everybody else was, we can't let Biden happen again. We can't let Trump happen again. They were all looking to the, in, in, to the rearview mirror. And Ramaswamy was the one who did, there wasn't a shining city on a hill. It wasn't that kind of a, a quotable moment, but at least it was a positive message looking out to the future. And I, and I agree with John, but this comes back to the point made earlier. Uh, is this going to, it's going to serve him very well in the primary. Uh, if it ever gets to, if he was the candidate for the general, they'll come back and haunt him. Whereas Nikki Haley was probably the opposite. If she does survive the primary, her debate performance on Wednesday will help her a great deal in the general. So. We move on to issue number three, and for that, Delegate Michael Height. All right. So I'm going to move on to a, a, um, a state issue, and my question is, what big item is remaining for justice to accomplish that could give him an edge in his upcoming election? Biggest fan of justice's accomplishments in the room is Larry Schultz. Larry, go. <laughs> that's car. new to I was going to say that's new to me. Um, I suppose he could um, find a way um, to attack some part uh, some unfavorable part of the populace in West Virginia uh, in a way that would make him more popular with the Republican base. Um, you know, I, I can't think who that would be. Uh, the the people who are unpopular with the Republican Party don't really have much of anything to lose. And so I don't know if there's a, a way he could do this. I suppose if he were to pick one cultural issue, like uh, DeSantis has done with the schools and libraries in Florida, he might be able to do something along those lines, some executive order that would cause a big kerfuffle and probably end up in nothing, but of course it would be useful to him uh, in the Republican primary. That's all I can think of, some culture issue. Mike Carl. I think the most <clears throat> important thing he could do to improve his chances uh, is to negotiate a favorable settlement of all the claims against him. <laughs> and, 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 and part of the deal would be that the people on the other side would say he's, been a, he's a good man and, you know, we, we recommend that, you know, he's a wonderful leader and all that. But I, I don't think there's any particular public policy agenda item that, that, that is more important uh, than getting rid of those problems. New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap. It is all one word. After it is. All. Um, I, I should. The honest thing for me to do is probably to recuse myself because I've only been in the state for for a year and a half. Um, but my impression of justice is to keep on keeping on, just stay friendly and, <laughs> and for lack of a better term, cuddly. You know, it's just I think that he comes off as such an affable. Guy, I'm sure that he's on the political side of things. Um, I understand he's not all that great to deal with, but just as a citizen and as a voter, um, I I think he's I, he's marching right where he needs to be. And apparently, we don't, you know being sued doesn't mean a lot when it comes down to to elections. So, 
I got excited for a second because you started off by saying my impression of Jim Justice. I thought he was going to do impression of Jim Justice. <laughs> I love you. I've been working on this for six months, ready to roll yeah. out in public. Yeah. I don't think Justice is going to have to do much because I think he's the favorite going in right now. But if he had to do something, I think addressing the marriage penalty and the tax code would be the most powerful, most effective thing he could do. See, I'm surprised nobody mentioned, especially you, Larry, the foster care issue in West Virginia, which is still an issue. It hasn't been solved just yet. Uh, obviously, the, the uh, DHHR split is supposed to help address that, but it's still clearly not resolved. I can't imagine a thing he would do that would help him in, the, in that situation. Given his record, I can't imagine anything he's capable of accomplishing in this brief period of time that would make a difference in this race. Well, and I, and the reason I asked the question is he's he's got one more state of the state address where he gets that bully pulpit. He gets to stand up in front of everybody and and say things and and use that as a way to propel his campaign. So, you know, what is it? What what one thing would propel that campaign? And and you mentioned the foster care issue. That may be one of those issues that's that's on the radar of the legislature, the legislature could tackle, and, and he could get a big win there. So that's what I'm looking for. What is going to come down at the state of the state address that the legislature is going to take up and he gets a big win for? Will another proposed raise for all state employees play well, Mike? It will obviously play well with those who are state employees, but what about the rest of the Republican voting public? Uh, yeah, I, I guess it depends on where the raise was for, who it was for. Um, in what areas? Obviously, um, you know, we, we've talked about corrections and how we still need to tackle fixing the, the non-uniformed officers corrections. Um, he, he would be a fool not to mention that in the state of the state and, and have the legislator, you know, the legislature is going to try to tackle that regardless. Um, but, you know, make it part of his his goals. Um, so, you know, in some respects, I, I think, uh, you know, t raises in pay will help. Mike, I just got a text from Eric Householder who says eliminate Social Security and marriage penalty. Now, by eliminate Social Security, I don't think he means eliminate Social Security. <laughs> I think he means any, any remaining taxes on Social Security. I think it's what Eric meant. You've had a good, you've had a good career, Eric. You're history now. We are going to eliminate That's Social exactly Security. That's exactly right. Yeah, that, that will play well. Going back to That's just, not what Eric meant. <laughs> that is not what Eric meant. <laughs> I've got it in writing right here, Mike. Yeah, regardless of what you might think, he couldn't do it even if he did mean that. I'm there for you, Mr. Majority Leader. That is not what he meant. <laughs> but going back to Justice for a second, uh, Mike, do you think he's getting the credit he deserves for the tax reform? Or in my sense, the legislators have gotten – more credit than uh, more public credit than what justice has, and they should. Well, and, yeah, probably <laughs> so. Yeah, but but uh, my point is, is he getting the credit that one could argue he deserves? He's getting some credit. He's not getting any more than he deserves. This was a legislature push. This has been a legislature push, and and I'll go back to to our majority leader, mm -hmm. Mr. Householder, yeah. who has been pushing for this kind of reform yeah. for years, and has been pushing the flatline budget for years so that this could be accomplished. So if anybody should get credit for that, it should be our majority leader. I but, think, but I, Eric's not running for uh, U.S. He's, Senate either. He's not, yeah. but he should get as much credit or more than anybody else. I think Jim's getting a ton of credit, yeah. and I'll, I'll tell, give you my examples of why I think he's good. First off, he got 70-whatever percent of the vote when he ran for re-election. Uh, everything he's wanted, he's gotten in his last term. He, he, even at the end of his first term, he wanted roads to prosperity. The voters gave it to him. He wanted an income tax, state income tax cut. Voters gave it to him. He wanted the four amendments defeated. Voters gave it to him. T tell me how he's not getting credit for it. The, the voters overwhelmingly give the governor what he wants. So I think he's getting a ton of credit. Well, any, any credit he gets for tax reform is necessary to overcome his call for tax increases mm -hmm. when he first came into office. Here, here. So, so the, the, he had a big negative to overcome, but the, clearly, Bill's right, the leadership of the tax reform now, is out of the legislature. In his defense, Mike, when he was proposing that tax increase, he was a Democrat. Then he got right thinking and switched to the Republican Party and got tax, <laughs> tax cuts. 
Well, I'll, I mean, give, I'll give him credit for learning good policy. <laughs> and he wasn't going to pay the taxes whether they were <laughs> right, 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 right or not. Right. He, he didn't worry about you know, He didn't have personal experience paying taxes. Uh, by the way, the governor will be at the air show uh, this weekend. I, I found that out yesterday. He'll be there in, uh, in the morning. So if you're heading out to the air show uh, tomorrow and Sunday, uh, Big Jim will be there on, uh, on Saturday. So on Saturday. Fa- final word goes to you, Mike Hype. Uh, you know, just what I said. I, I think that he's going to take advantage of in the state of state uh, address um, to to try to bring out something that's going to be big to help him in his campaign, uh, the raises for individuals or, or tackling, uh, you know, the, the child care issue, the foster care issue could be a big win for him. All right, uh, Larry Schultz, you are on the clock for issue number th- uh, four, I guess we roll on to here next. Issue number four, and for that, we go to Larry Schultz. Yeah, why did none of the Fox News hosts ask the candidates if or why they believed they would be a better president than Donald Trump? That's a good question. That would be interesting to know what those answers were. I watched the whole thing. That was the one question I was waiting for, and it never even got asked, let alone addressed by, you know the candidates don't want to talk about it. That's why you ask it. Um, I the only thing I can think is they are like all those candidates on the stage terribly afraid of that 58% whatever it is a uh, uh, finding and they and and there's a you know it's a sort of oh we can't we can't jostle the king um and there was very little criticism of Donald Trump in that whole thing except from Chris Christie um but uh, you know we, I was surprised, too, that Christie didn't say, you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to tell you why I'd be a better president than him. Well, you, uh, yeah, Nikki Haley Bill, also. Bill, you need a microphone. I'm sorry. Nikki Haley also criticized by saying we cannot win the election with Donald Trump. Yeah, and I think they started off with saying, let's address the elephant in the room because the elephant in the room is not in the room. Um, but you're right. They didn't tackle why do you think you might be a better president. And, you know. Yeah, I would say that some of that has to do with Fox News is is a conservative news channel, and they probably didn't want to uh, up you know, disrupt the up tip the boat or whatever you want to say too much. Um, so they didn't. Not that they didn't ask tough questions, but they they didn't ask that specific question. I would expect that kind of a question out of a CNN panel or MSNBC panel, um, and the. There'll be plenty of opportunities for that question to be asked in the future. I, I do think it's a legitimate question, though, sure. because it's a primary. It's, yes. it's not, if Trump had, had served two consecutive terms and was terming out, it's not a valid, legitimate question of, of for Republicans. But while you're competing against them in a primary, I do think that's a legitimate question. My call. The, the only way I can – I agree with most of the comments, but the only way I can defend the absence of that question is that because – he wasn't able to be there because of what, you know, a lot of his people and a lot of Republicans uh, and certainly a lot of Fox viewers believe, you know, in, in proper prosecutions and so forth. So he, he wasn't there to defend himself, but it was, you know, it was create It was like putting him there without an ability to defend himself, raising, raising that point. But it, it, objectively, you're right, if it was a – not just liberal-based media, but even objective media would have asked that question. But is that why he wasn't there? I thought he was there because he wouldn't sign uh, a piece of paper saying that if if you're not the nominee, you'll support the the, who, the eventual nominee. So if he wasn't willing to sign that and all the rest of them were, I, I thought that's why he wasn't there. I think the reason he was not there was he didn't have to be there. He With a 40-point lead, why, point. Do you, uh, why do you get on the stage? John? Under these circumstances, I think it's an impolite question um, for the reasons that Mike mentioned, that it's just he can't defend himself. So the question itself invites purely ad hominem attacks that can't be defended against. I'm better because I don't I didn't violate the law. I didn't do this. Whatever whatever would be the attacks against Trump without him there to defend it. It just it becomes eight different sets of ad hominems. And I and I think that's. 
it, it would make it would make for a bad debate actually now if if it had been more specific if you were president and such and such happened how would you have reacted differently that's i think a, a, a great question but the open ended how would you be a better president i just i don't think it's a good question it it is a little difficult for me to process the notion that somehow other people making ad hominem attacks on him is unfair to Donald Trump. <laughs> That's all he does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, for once, you know, we get, we got him out of the room. Let's go ahead and talk. Well, he can't even call in and answer us. Isn't right? that how you want to shine? Look, I, I went through this entire debate. And I didn't do a, a single personal attack on anybody. If nothing else, you can shine in the absence of, of the negative. So I think right. by not, not asking questions because he's not there gives him, by default, control of the debate to some extent. It's not the network's fault he chose to not be there. Because he's not there shouldn't dictate what questions are asked about why would you not be a better, you know, would you be a better president? How would you be a better president? Some form of that question. I would like to know the answer to that question because there's eight of them who trail him magnificently in the polls. If you add up all eight of them, they don't equal what he has in the polls. So why are you people here? Well, you're here because you think you'd be a better president than he is or else you wouldn't be running. Tell me why you'd be a better president. I don't think it's, I don't think it's an illegitimate question in the least. And I do not think it's an impolite question either. All credit to you, Mr. Gilstrap. Let's just uh, keep build, beating on John Gilstrap. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he hogged my camera a while ago. <laughs> he did. In fact, <laughs> when you've been talking, he's been pushing your yeah, chair out of the way. Right. That's why Bill keeps sliding out of the wall picture. Now. And job, then he John. pulls the mic back toward him. Yeah. It's tough, John. Bill, it is. Buddy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's the uh, the... I guess it comes back to the question we asked earlier, why wasn't he there? Uh, if it was truly that he had uh, uh, court cases, he was going to be uh, uh, all the indictments against him, then I think it would have been an impolite question. I honestly do not believe that that was, not, that was the reason he was not there. I believe he was not there because he felt he did not have to be there. He had sufficient cushion as long. And so why absorb the, the barbs and the bullets and the spears been thrown at you if, uh, if you got such a huge lead? So I think that was his, own, his choice of not to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a consequence, I think the question was very legitimate and should have been and could have been answered. Bill, you bring up a, a good point that he wasn't there because he didn't have to be. And now it allows him on Twitter or social media or wherever to rebut anything anybody said about him without having come back. So, he, you know, it, the Nikki Haley or, or even Chris Christie that, that threw stones at him, he can sit back now and, and throw stones back without having to worry about – um, being addressed on stage. Yeah, and he had his people in the spin room, so he had a, a real time uh, rebutting those. But everybody anticipated Chris Christie uh, being most direct and throwing stones at, at uh, Donald Trump. I think Nikki Haley was more effective by saying uh, uh, we cannot win with Donald Trump. He al she also said he is the most hated politician in America today. Uh, those are pretty big stones to be tossed, especially on a Republican debate. And especially coming from somebody who was part of his administration. Exactly right. Exactly. I think you could piggyback that question with should Donald Trump have been there? And if I was advising Trump, not that he listens to advisors, he does what he wants. Um, he's, he's earned that right. You know, I, I don't disagree with him. You're the one that's you know, your name's associated with. If you're going down, you might as well be the person who does, you know, all the decision making. But I would have advised him to not be there. Well, you don't have to be. You're up by forty whatever points. Right. You know, plus anything that you say that's questionable might work against you, and then some of these indictments. So and, don't go. And exactly right. You, he, Donald Trump had absolutely nothing to gain right. for being there. Had a lot to lose. Uh, so if he had stumbled on something, it could have cost him. So why go? Why go? Why go? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. All right. Uh, it comes back to you, Larry, for the final thought. Yeah, I agree with what uh, a lot of what has been said here, and it, and it reinforces something that I thought of um, earlier, which is I think the real winner of the debate um, Wednesday night was Fonnie Willis <laughs> and not any of the candidates. Uh, this became about her. And there are even some people who think that 
because he had to go to court, he couldn't be in the debate. Um, that's not true, but there are some people who think that's true. And so it turns out that the way this lined up, none of them, and because Fox wouldn't ask the question, none of them really gained any ground that I can see. Uh, it'll be mm -hmm. fun to watch the polls come out. Yeah, Judy Boykin points out that a question was asked, would you support Trump uh, during the debate? Uh, I'm not sure how that was answered by all eight. I think that was one of the questions I heard when I was yeah. driving in. I don't remember. But the only but one, the thing Christie obviously would about. not. That's yeah. the thing they'd written a pledge yeah, they, about. Yeah. The only one that did not that said, had his hand down was Hutchison. Uh, uh, Chris Christie had his hand about halfway up and started <laughs> making excuses. But Hutchison's yeah. the only one that refused to raise that. One other point I think would go on this. There is some talk that uh, this was actually a debate for vice president mm -hmm. more so than president. Uh, that vice president uh, slot is getting pretty crowded with Kerry Lake from Arizona, Marjorie Taylor Greene, <laughs> uh, and now... Uh, 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 Rasam, uh, Ramasami. Uh, so all of that those... would be your worst nightmare if he became. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Marjorie Taylor <laughs> Green and uh, Carrie Lake are uh, would be very close. Yeah, but you can pronounce those names pretty easily. Oh, you told me pronounce... <laughs> 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 that doesn't worry me, Rob. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think any of the eight you saw on stage are are going to be a vice presidential pick. Uh, if uh, well, Trump is the nominee. Uh, Trump is very quick to point out at the debate that Ramasamy did a great job. Yeah, I still don't think he'll be the vice presidential pick. Yeah, I can't yeah. imagine uh, that Mike Pence would take it. I don't. Think I can't he imagine. Picked, I, I, no. he, 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 I don't think he picked Pence. No. I, I've said, yeah. I said it earlier this week. I think he'd pick his uh, a family member. I think he'd pick his daughter, for instance. <laughs> you know, traditionally, traditionally, a, a vice presidential pick is somebody that can bring you a state that he is in need purple. It. Well, maybe he does because there are a lot of purple states out there that he still needs to win. So normally that. That vice presidential pick is somebody from a state like Virginia or Pennsylvania or Minnesota that is purple and, and can bring votes on, onto your side of the ticket. So none of the people on stage I see right now really help him. No, I agree. That's why I said none of those eight would be. Uh, but I don't see his, his family members helping either. Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, uh, taking a governor from a state that's purple, and I'm, I don't know what would be uh, a situation that matches that. I haven't researched it. I think this guy learned in his last administration that he needs loyalty above and beyond everything else. And, and, and who is he going to count on when it comes down to it? His family. Yeah, but Mike, to answer your question, that's a criteria. It'd be clear Kerry Lake would be the one because it could, be, uh, could provide Arizona to it. Or, or, or the, the Virginia governor. Or Virginia governor, exactly right. I yeah, can't yeah, imagine yeah, yeah. him <laughs> stepping out of what looks like a very clean path through one term as governor and then on to the Senate or the presidency and saying, oh, yeah, here's what I should do halfway through my governor's term. I should quit and hitch my trailer yeah. to the Trump truck. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know that that's the path to get to the White House. Being vice president is rarely the path to the White House anyway if you want to be the president. But I don't know that that would be the path if you were the person who was trying to be president in 28. Just a thought. We go to issue number five, and for that, Mike will come. Well, we've changed uh, sides of the aisle. Uh, there's growing evidence, you know, that, that President Biden is failing mentally and physically. Um, and the, my, so my question is, who is the likely, assuming something happened to Biden, you know, that not, uh, you know, not political blow up, but, but you know, some physical limitations that really um, he needed to be replaced. Uh, You're talking about as, pre as presently a, or in a second term? As, 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 a as, as the candidate and, and, all, and, and then, you know, of course, as president, but, but certainly but sometime, sometime between, but before the, you know, the next, the coming general election. And who in the Democratic Party is – you know, is the best prospect from from their point of view as a as a nominee as a nominee. Right. Who in the Democratic Party is the best prospect to replace Biden if it turns out he doesn't run for president and as, as reelected president? Larry, probably Gavin Newsom. That's one name that occurs to me. Um, a pretty popular governor in California would bring a ton of votes day one with him. Um, 
uh, there's probably a couple other examples. Um, I, I think the governor of Maryland, were he more experienced than he happens to be since he just got elected, um, Mr. Moore, um, I think he might uh, be a future presidential candidate. He's a pretty appealing candidate. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Bill? Um, I think the obvious one is Gretchen Whitman uh, of Michigan. There's a good one. There's and, another good one, yeah. Yeah, because she has the Midwest. She's She has been quite successful. Uh, she's also very successful in 2022 by uh, getting several of her her candidates uh, elected. Uh, she's a force to be reckoned with. Mr. Gilstrap. I think Gavin Newsom would run over his grandmother to get into the White House. So <laughs> I, I think he would certainly be... Uh, top of, of the list to want it, I think. Well, RFK Jr. has already declared he's an interesting candidate. I thought I, I, I thought RFK Jr. handled himself very well in that free speech hearing that, that he did. I don't think the Democrats have a very deep bench at, at this point in terms of nationally recognized. Gretchen Whitmer, I think, has a lot of naysayers attached to her um, through the, the COVID stuff that happened and... and um, so, I don't know, but I think Gavin Newsom is, is the obvious choice. Michael? Michael. Me? Michael. Okay. So, um, I, I don't think it's going to be Gavin Newsom. I think he would probably try to get in there, but I would think Whitmer would be a better pick for the Democratic Party. I think Newsom has a lot of baggage. People are leaving California in droves, even though he would pull a lot of votes from California. That's absolutely true. But but he has a really bad record, I think. And and that would be uh, at the foremost of anybody's campaign against him is his actual record and what's going on in California. He would be a terrible candidate. I also don't think you can uh, count out Joe Manchin. Um, right now, he hasn't decided he's going to no labels. He's a Democrat. He's a popular Democrat, and he could pull a red state over to the Democratic Party. So I wouldn't count him out either, but I, I agree Gretchen Whitmer would pure, probably be at the top of that list. Back to you, Mike. Let me back off a second. I'm going to yield to Mike, uh, Hike, because I think Joe Manchin, if he was to run uh, outside of West Virginia, he would be a very, very popular candidate. All right, Michael. Well, I, I agree with that last statement, too. But, but I, I, I slightly agree with, with uh, Bill about the, uh, uh, the Gretchen Whitmer uh, as, as, as the most likely uh, prospect. But the, the point is that all this agonizing and questions and you know, uncertainty was even worse in 2020. And that's why Biden is the president. He was their nominee and got elected uh, in 2020, and and that's that's telling about that party, but because she, she wasn't a player, you know, in in in, in 2020, she she you know her all her claim to fame has emerged since then. So so I I and I I, I agree about the guy in California. I mean he he would be. If he's the no Democrat nominee, I don't care who the Republican is. The Republicans are, <laughs> Republicans are back in the White House. All right, we have time for a bonus issue. I'm going to go to Bill Stubblefield on the bonus issue, and that is the LIV. Yeah, LIV. Uh, there was an article in the Metro News this past week that I found to be intriguing. Uh, and on 4th of August, uh, uh, the LIV golf turn held a golf tournament uh, at Greenbrier. Uh, Justice was very prominent in, in promoting it. He went there several times. He got a lot of criticism uh, from some of the folks in the legislators and, uh, legislative body saying he should have been in Charleston. Uh, instead, he was uh, holding court or playing uh, flitzes with the, uh, with the Saudis. Uh, I pose this question to the breakfast group that Mike Carl alluded to earlier, and, they, and the group was said, nobody cares about the LIV uh, for election purposes. It's, it's, it's a non-starter. I guess thinking about it, I don't believe that's right. Uh, West Virginia 
are basically they they have high values. They recognize good from bad. The Saudis have had a pretty bad record. Uh, 9/11. Also, more recently, this Washington Post fellow that was assassinated, these are tied very closely to Saudis. Uh, is uh, in Trump, uh, not Trump, but Justice supposedly used this as a fundraiser. Uh, I, I wonder, the question is, will there be pol enough um, uh, fodder uh, for it to become a political issue in the, U uh, the primary for the U.S. Senate? Associating with the Saudis. Uh, associating with the Saudis and playing footsies with the Saudis, if you will, and uh, trying to uh, uh, court the Saudis. Another thing that, uh, that struck me with this is during the Greenbrier, there were no U.S. vendors. All the vendors were Saudi vendors. None from West Virginia. Yeah. Mike Carl. That, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I, I didn't follow the those details at breakfast yesterday yeah. as much, but, but uh, I, I think it is a, uh, and, and, you know, his, his opponent, and uh, I think his main opponent, I think probably will exploit the heck out of that and, 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 and maybe get Trump to back him for that reason. And if that happens, then, then you know, we've got a different U.S. senator. Mike Height. Um, I don't think it's as big an issue as, as, as what you would like to portray it as. Um, I, I went to the Live Tournament. I'm not going to lie. I don't think in the legislature, a whole lot of people in the legislature had a problem with it. A um, uh, little interesting tidbit I didn't know until I went. To LIV actually is, is stands for 54 because mm -hmm. they play 54 holes. Yeah. It's not Live. Um, but, you know, the, the tournament, should he have been in Charleston? when we were getting ready to do a, a special session, you know, some people say so, but I mean, I think governors can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. So um, he could have called the special session um, while he's sitting on the golf course uh, dealing with Saudis. So I don't think that had any, really anything to do with it. Um, I think that was just a way to, to uh, attack him because we didn't get the call as soon as some people would have liked it. Um, will it be used against him? I'm sure that, that Mooney will try to use it against him. I, I wouldn't blame him. You know, you try to use anything you can. But I don't think for the majority of West Virginians it's that big a deal. So the governor might be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, but can the guy who carries his chair? That's the big question. <laughs> well, yeah, he can he can walk and carry baby dog at the same time. I would like to meet the person who served as an interpreter between Jim Justice <laughs> and these Saudi billionaires. Um, I, that's a person with some language skills. I want him as a speechwriter for my candidate um, because uh, Jim doesn't speak what we most of us would consider to be English or American English. He speaks a sort of Greenbrier English that's pretty limited in its <laughs> scope. And it must have been very confusing for if they brought in these uh, interpreters. It must have been very confusing to pass the words back and forth. Mr. Gilstrap. I can't imagine it's going to be too much of a liability. You know, it'll, it'll be a t formed as an attack ad, and the response to it is a very simple, hey, I get to hang out with who I want to hang out with. I'm a billionaire, too, so I'm going to hang out with other billionaires. I'm going to play some golf. And it is it is my green briar i just i think it's so easy to to slough it off that it's not going to be an issue bill final thought comes yeah. back to you uh, going back to mike kite's point about the legislators not involved uh some some take exception eric tar for example is mm -hmm. one that is kind of stirring the flames more than anybody else i was struck by the fact that for the uh, uh metro news article uh they asked uh, uh congressman mooney to respond or to comment he did not at the time whether he was chose not to get involved in this issue or saving it for a later time, don't know. But you're right, it's not a major issue, but it could be add to other things. Final thoughts are coming up next. Get yours together now. It's eight seconds, Larry, go. Eight days from today in Happy Valley at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday, September 2nd. The Mountaineers take the field against the Penn State and Nittany Lions. Sorry, Mike, you're not going to get any time Either. now. Bill Stubblefield. <laughs> the world wants to know what's Joe Peretti doing today. Is he getting in line to get some of the Trump litigation dollars? John Gilstrap. Whatever you're doing, Joe, thanks. I've enjoyed being here at the table in your place. Mike Carl. 
Cards need to move ahead of the Pirates so they don't finish last for the first time in 33 years. Mike, cut your shut out. The Dave Ramsey Show is going to be up next. This is Tom come Randy. out to the air show. Everybody come to the air show. Don't talk to you in 70 short hours. It's 5 o'clock somewhere.